On today's episode of the John Campia Show podcast, the director of the Fantastic Beast film says that the Warner Brothers has officially parked the franchise. Also, there's a report out that 4-5 is in active development, but they're looking for a new director and Taika Waititi will not be back to do part 5. Also, Gen V has cracked the top 10 Nielsen ratings, proving again that the week-to-week -week releases works better than the all-at-once releases. And finally, Henry Cavill's Highlander remake is officially a go. It's going to the American film market. That and a whole bunch more. The John Cabot Show podcast starts right now. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the Best Damn Movie Related Show on the Planet Earth, the John Campus Show podcast, coming to you from right here in our delightful little studio, brought to you in part by our friends at Mint Mobile. I am, of course, your host, Obi John Kenobi, and it's an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, our international friends, gather around to so talk about our favorite things in the world movies, movie news, TV, streaming, all sorts of good stuff. Not just giving you our opinions, but also giving you some background information and context so you guys can form your own well informed opinions, whether they're the same or completely different than ours. Uh, joining us in the studio today, we got Ray Aura. The Jedi. <laughs> did you die or the, the Jedi? The Jedi. <laughs> right beside him is Jonathan Voiko. I did not die. <laughs> Chris Carr is here. Hi. And most importantly, <laughs> You guys are here. Thanks for making this show part of your day. Here's how it's going to go. We're going to start off by talking about those topics that I listed off. And then in the last part of the show, we're going to take your topics and questions. Uh, we already went to our beloved YouTube channel members. We put up a community post every day just for our channel members, asking them if ha they have any topics, and they sent in a bunch. But also, if you are watching live right now, you can use the Super Chat feature to send in some topics, and we'll get to those at the end of the show. Also want to remind you guys that this show is primarily done as a podcast and you can't always be in front of a YouTube video. Maybe you're at work, maybe you're commuting. Well, that's why we do have the podcast, the John Campia Show podcast available on Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast, go and subscribe to it today. So it'll be there when you need it. All right, guys, with all that down, let's dive into it, shall we? We're going to start off with this. Fantastic Beasts, to nobody's surprise, it's now being said by the director of the franchise that Warner Brothers has, quote-unquote, parked the franchise. Now, this comes just from the folks over at The Hollywood Reporter who said the following. Warner Brothers has cast an immobilist spell on Fantastic Beasts. Director David Yates gave an update about the beleaguered franchise, which halted after three of its five planned films were released. With Beasts, for a minute... It's all just parked, Yates told the Inside, uh, the Inside Total Film podcast. We got to the end of the third film, 2020's Fantastic Beasts, the sequel to Dumbledore, and we're all so proud of that movie. And when it went out into the world, we just needed to sort of stop and pause and take it easy. And that, of course, comes to us again from The Hollywood Reporter. You know, Fantastic Beasts is an interesting, and I think moving forward into future years, will continue to be an interesting study in film franchise marketing, film franchise navigation, and, and all this kind of stuff. Look, I, everybody understands when the Harry Potter franchise and Warner Brothers was very, very anxious at the time to look for ways to stay in this wizarding world of Harry Potter. I mean, that was high on their priority list. It's clearly what they want to do. And they decided to go on a little bit of a prequel route and go with Fantastic Beasts. And it started off at least box office wise, pretty strong. But as you can see, it started to, well, drizzle a little bit. The first Fantastic Beasts movie, uh, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, made over $800 million at the box office. However, the second one took a dip down to a still respectable $655 million. And that brought us into the third one of Fantastic Beasts, The Secrets of Dumbledore at $407 million, which is a you know almost half of what the first one came out to, which is actually kind of funny because I thought Dumbledore was actually a pretty good movie. I, I, I'm not a big Potterhead, but I thought, I thought overall the franchise was okay. Uh, I liked Crimes of Grindelwald and I quite enjoyed Secrets of Dumbledore. The first one was a little bit weak to me. So, I mean, it's no surprise. We've heard a lot of talk in, in recent months over the past year that it looked like Warner Brothers was going to kind of abandon the Fantastic Beasts and the finances clearly kind of point out why but now the question becomes what went wrong because i'll still contend they didn't do a bad job making they didn't make bad movies 
I mean, they weren't up to the caliber of the Harry Potter films. I think that much is pretty much universally agreed upon. But the first one was all right. I thought the second one was good. And I thought the third one was quite good. But they kept going down. Uh, Chris, I would propose this. When I look back at the Fantastic Beasts films, I think the third film is what made the problem of the franchise really stand out, which was until the third film, it never felt like it was in the wizarding world of Harry Potter. Like it felt like you were in a world with wizards. Mm -hmm. They mention Hogwarts. They, you know, but it never felt through the first two movies that you were revisiting the wizarding world. It, it just never felt like that. It's once you got into the third film and you realize they revisited and went back to Hogwarts. It's like, all of a sudden, it just felt like you were in that world again. Hogwarts itself was kind of like a character in the movie in many ways. It just has its own personality. It brings its own energy to the screen. And for me personally, I don't think they were bad movies. I just think they did a bad job of making it feel like the world of Harry Potter. I don't know. What do you think about them saying that the franchise is now parked? And where do you think this franchise went wrong that the third film ended up making just half of what the first film did? What do you think? First, we just got to point out that Hollywood reporter reporter is so proud of themselves for that Immobilis. Oh, oh yeah. I just, when you read that, I'm like, <laughs> he's such a nerd. They're like, oh, my time has come. Uh, it makes sense to me that they're stopping this, though. Just because the, these films have had a downward trajectory and it's been this kind of cornucopia of reasons why it hasn't done well. You know, we have controversy in front of the camera, behind the camera with some of the people involved. Uh, we aren't with the OG Harry Potter characters that we know and love. Um, and honestly, a big part of it too was if we were going to explore America and, and their Wizarding World, I kind of the opposite issue that you have here of. That first movie, I really like all the beasts. I really like everything that's happening there. And then the Creedence stuff kind of also feels a little disconnected somehow mm. of this feels a little different, but I like all this magic stuff, but we got, we know we have to figure out something here. And then it comes to fruition that this is to tie into the twist of having Grindelwald be there the entire time, leading us into kind of Dumbledore's dark past and all these other things, right? And it just felt like they were really ham-fistedly trying to make this connect to Harry Potter's actual narrative, as opposed to just connecting the worlds. Because for me, at first it was, oh, how cool, we're taking almost an open world approach to exploring the wizarding world. Because it isn't just England, it isn't just the UK, as we right. slowly start to learn by the fourth book or fourth movie, there's wizarding schools all over the place. That makes sense. Wizards aren't only in Europe. So <laughs> I liked the idea of exploring America, but then we had to tie it back into the original story. And then they just narratively and character wise made weird choices. Like Queenie getting all evil made no sense. I kind of liked it. But it didn't have any rhyme or reason to happen. It didn't make sense for her character. It was just, you know, it'd be cool if she broke bad. I, I don't, I don't know that I agree with that. I think there's something about her that was like from the cla a classic tale of somebody who buys into, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not indoctrination. They get indoctrinated, but somebody who buys into the propaganda. I mean, she, she definitely would be part of a multi-level marketing scheme. <laughs> that is perfectly it. Yeah. She really would. Grindelwald was ultimately a multi-level marketing scheme. <laughs> it was just one of those moments of, I don't feel like Queenie would be a character who'd go into a room and go, yeah, this Hitler-esque figure has some great ideas. I don't I don't see that happening, but maybe that's just me. Um, I just feel like they got too too bloated with what they were trying to accomplish. Um, and and the more the movies went on, the less they got about Fantastic Beasts. <laughs> so I don't I yeah. don't think you can call it a Fantastic Beast franchise. Yeah, they kind of abandoned the Fantastic Beasts aspect of yeah. it. Again, I, oddly enough to me, the franchise, I think I'm the opposite of you. I think the franchise started weak and it got better as it went. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, yeah, Jude Law's Dumbledore. You know what? He's they really should Dumbledore. not have, they should have done this with the franchise from the beginning, made it about Jude Law's Dumbledore, not about Newt Scamander. Um, not that I had any problem with the character either, but yeah, first film down to the second film took a significant drop. Second film to the third film continued the drop. It's, and as, uh, as much as I like Newt, it's hard to make a film about a pacifist. A very quiet yeah, he yeah. doesn't come across as a great protagonist. Yeah. So that makes it a little bit difficult for them to do. So listen, obviously Warner Brothers still has big plans for the Wizarding World. They want to do a lot of stuff. They're talking about turning all the original books now into a TV series. It just sounds like the world of Newt's Commander might be sidelined. All right, guys, with that down, let's move on to this, shall we? 
You know, say what you will about Thor Love and Thunder, the movie still made north of $700 million at the box office, which is nearly two Black Adams. Uh, just uh, throwing Whoa, that out that's there. that's good math. <laughs> uh, that's just some very quick math. <laughs> but I think most people would also agree it was certainly a step down from Thor Ragnarok. Like whether you hated Thor Love and Thunder or still appreciated it, I think we all agree it was a big drop off from Thor Ragnarok. I think everybody can at least agree with that. So that brought up the question that despite how great Taika Waititi did with Thor Ragnarok and despite how they kind of really like what he did with Mandalorian and working in that universe as well, a lot of people started to believe that maybe if they did a fifth one, maybe it'd be best for Taika to move on and do something else and bring in some new fresh blood again. Well, according to a new report that's floating around out there, that's exactly what's happening. Now, this all comes from Daniel RPK, who we've quoted him a little bit in the last couple of days. Daniel RPK, of course, is an industry insider. Not always right, but right often enough that you got to pay attention that when he brings something like this up. And this came to us from CBR, who pointed out this tweet, but said this, Thor 5 is officially in development. This is what Daniel RPK says at Marvel Studios. Marvel is currently searching for a new director to helm the film, meaning that Taika Waititi will not return. All right. I think this is interesting on several levels. Number one, I don't know why anybody ever doubted that there would be a Thor 5. I mean, yes, Chris Hemsworth did say, He's stepping back from acting a little bit. He's, he did not say he was retiring. He said he's going to slow down because of his genetic testing. And he's found he's predisposed to certain, you know, conditions if he's not careful. But he never said he wasn't going to be doing another Thor. And I think everybody knew they'd be doing another Thor. All of them have made money, so on and so forth. Also, for Chris Hemsworth himself, Taika Waititi saved Thor. Like with Thor Ragnarok, uh, Chris Hemsworth has talked a lot about the fact that he was starting to get tired of playing Thor. And then when Taika Waititi came in and kind of took it in the direction in Thor Ragnarok that he did, you know, Chris Hemsworth has talked many times about how the fact that that just breathed new life into the character for him. He loves the, he made him love playing the character again and all that kind of stuff. But I think after Thor Love and Thunder, we need another course correction with the character. Right, they lose. They did a course correction, loosening him up, and it worked great for Thor for Ragnarok. Then they continued a little bit too far in that direction, and we got Thor: Love and Thunder. And I think another course correction, maybe coming back to the center a little bit more, might be in order for a Thor five. And to do that, I think you need to move on to a new director. Now, don't get me wrong. Taiko Titi, I think, is one of the most talented. He's an Oscar-winning filmmaker. I think he's one of the most talented filmmakers out there. Uh, when you look down his resume of all the stuff he's done. He's awesome. I mean, I didn't love Thor 11 Thunder, but everything else he's done has been absolutely phenomenal. I can't wait to see next goal of wins. So, but, and so if they did say he would be coming back for Thor 5, I'd be like, okay, yeah, let's go. I'm sure he'll learn some from the mistakes of Thor 4 and we'll do something great. But I actually do kind of prefer the idea at this point of let's bring in a new fresh set of eyes, a new, a new fresh voice in the director's chair and see what they can do and reinvigorate Chris Hemsworth in the kind of chair again. And, you know, especially with the departure of Chris Evans, Robert Downey Jr., they'll both be back eventually. But with their <laughs> departure, uh, Scarlett Johansson now moved on. The Hulk is wearing Hawaiian shirts at family barbecues. They need an anchor. They need sure. an anchor. And, and I think Thor can be that anchor. But to be that anchor, you got to swing him back more towards the middle, away from the kind of the extreme silliness of what, Thor Love and Thunder was, even though I still think Thor Love and Thunder definitely had his moments. Anyway, Chris, you hear this report coming out. Uh, number one, do you believe the report that Marvel is planning on a Thor or Thor five? And what would you think about the notion that, you know, going into, you know, the fifth Thor film that they'd be looking for a new director at this point? What do you think? I absolutely think another Thor is in the works. Why wouldn't there be? It made money. And Chris, look at him. Look at him. That's <laughs> Thor. Come on. Not since Vincent D'Onofrio have I believed a man should be Thor more. <laughs> All right? This is wonderful. But when it comes to Taika, I absolutely think it's time for him to move on. Jonathan had to correct me because when we were talking before the show started, I thought Kenneth Branagh did the first two films. No, he so just it, did the first one. Yeah, it was Alan Taylor who did the yeah. second one. And so it was just, oh yeah, that just seems to be the natural, natural progression. You do some Thor movies, you move on. But that's also been the case with Marvel as a whole, is usually some directors stick around for two, maybe three movies, if that, and then they go do something else because Marvel opens a lot of doors for them when they do a movie well. Yeah. So... 
it completely makes sense to me that Taika would move on from this. Also because he's a dude who has wonderful creative vision. He likes to make movies with his friends. He's gone on record talking about how all I really want to do is make art with people I like. That's it. Yeah. I really don't care about anything else. And so I'm sure he wants to do other creative projects. He's got, um, I was just catching up on it last night, Our Flag Means Death that he's acting in, which is delightful. He's got Next Goal Wins coming out, which looks fantastic. He has so many different types of stories he wants to tell. And you know, Chris Hemsworth has gone on record talking about how his children's uh, friends have been bullying him about how Thor, uh, Thor <laughs> had too much humor in it. Where it was like, oh, the VFX were great, but they were, it was too funny, <laughs> Mr. Hemsworth. Um, and so, you know, I'm sure Taika's like, yeah, I don't want to be bullied by my children. Let's go. <laughs> Let's do something else. Uh, yeah, I, uh, yeah. Look, I, I just very much am down for another Thor film. Yeah. Let's see what happens here. And and by the way, Taika Waititi is also married to Rita Ora, mm -hmm. so he probably wants to stay home a lot too. So I, who, who would blame him for that? All right, guys, with that down, we still got to talk about Gen V has cracked the Nielsen top 10 and what that tells us about week to week releases. Also, Henry Cavill's Highlander is finally now official. We're going to talk about that and a whole bunch more. But before we do, we're going to take a quick second and thank a couple of sponsors of today's episode of the John Campbell Show podcast. Our friends at Masterclass and the most comfortable shoes I've ever owned, Vessi. We want to take a moment and thank the sponsor of this video, Masterclass. Guys, you know, as a small business owner, I am finding myself having to be in negotiations all the time, whether it's with new contractors, vendors, or even agencies that represent our company. Now, I don't like to go into these negotiations unarmed, so I found the perfect class on Masterclass, The Art of Negotiation by Chris Voss, a real-life former FBI lead hostage negotiator. Taking this class on Masterclass made me feel a lot more equipped and confident going into all these various negotiations I have to do on a regular basis. With Masterclass, you can learn from the best to become your best anytime, anywhere, and at your own pace. An annual membership starts at just $10 a month, and you get unlimited access to every instructor, thousands of online lessons, exclusive content, insight, and much more. There are over 180 classes to pick from, everything from filmmaking with Martin Scorsese all the way to cooking with the great Gordon Ramsay. In Masterclass, you will find practical lessons that you can apply to your life and work. So guys, get unlimited access to every class. And right now, as a John Campia Show listener, you can get 15% off when you go to masterclass.com slash campia. That's masterclass.com slash campia for 15% off an annual membership. Masterclass.com slash campia. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of this video, Vessi. Now you guys know I'm not exactly the most fashion conscious guy in the world, but I love a great pair of shoes that are comfortable and I can wear almost anywhere. And growing up in Canadian winters when my feet got wet a lot, waterproof would be nice too. Enter Vessi. They make the claim that they're not just fashionable and super comfortable, they're also waterproof. Now you guys remember, when I got my first pair of Vessis, I put them to the ultimate waterproof test. I actually stuck my foot in my pool, my feet stayed dry, and the shoes stayed dry. Incredible. And they're the most comfortable pair of shoes I ever owned. Well, that made me want another pair. So I got another pair of Vessis that look great and just equal that world-class comfort that I got from that first pair of shoes. They are absolutely my favorite shoes that I've ever owned. Imagine your favorite sneaker style supercharged with waterproof technology and unmatched comfort. No matter how you like to stay active, Vessi has the shoes for you. Trail ready high tops, effortless slip-ons, and classic court shoes, all with a waterproof twist. They are just as comfortable and stylish as your favorite sneakers, but even more versatile. So guys, if you're anything like me and you want the most comfortable pair of shoes that look great, that you can take out hiking, wear to work, go to the gym, or walk through the water and snow, go to Vessi.com slash Campia and get yourself a pair today. Go to Vessi.com slash Campia and get 15% off your order using the code Campia. And thank you to our friends at Masterclass and Vessi for sponsoring this episode of the John Campia Show podcast. All right, guys, with that down, Let's get on to this, shall we? Gen V is just flat out my favorite show that's currently airing. Uh, that's on TV right now. I am absolutely adoring it. As I've said before, I had my doubts about it. I thought it was just going to be a cheap The Boys knockoff, even though it was, you know, a spinoff of the show. 
but I have adored this show, the character work, the storylines, all that kind of stuff, and the edginess, I mean, the, the grossness and the gore and everything else. They just put it into one big, beautiful, filthy package. I've absolutely adored it. Well, apparently it's not so niche anymore. As reports have come out that Nielsen is now reporting that Gen V, after its third episode, has climbed into the top 10 on the ratings chart. This comes to us from Deadline, who say the following. Nielsen also once again stressed how staggered release strategies, that's week to week, appear to be working much better for streamers than binge releases. A new entrant to the streaming originals list is Gen V, the college set spinoff of The Boys, which the streamer recently called its most acquisitive new original series of 2023 as it renewed the series for season two. With just three episodes available, the series racked up 374 million minutes viewed according uh, coming in at number eight on the originals chart. Now, by the way, on the overall chart, number one is anybody want to guess? Suits. Suits. Still number one. <laughs> Suits Jeez. is still the number one show in the world. Anyway, but on the original charts coming in at number eight, it's interesting to note that the first episode did not have it crack the top 10. The second episode did not have it crack the top 10. It's the third episode. And that goes what to what Nielsen was saying in that first paragraph. The week to week strategy works much better. Now, I'm not saying that means you as a viewer need to prefer the week to week releases. I know there are a lot of my friends prefer the Netflix model of just dropping the whole season at once and then binging it right then and there. But if that had happened with Gen V, a bunch of people would have watched it. And then five days later, nobody would be talking about it again. And you never would see Gen V cracking something like the Nielsen's top 10. Never would have happened. Just would have come out. Those who did see it then would have stopped talking about it. And then it would have disappeared with the week to week strategy. If your show's good, I mean, that's a big asterisk to <laughs> this whole this whole strategy is the show's got to be good. But with a good show, word of mouth spreads. People talk about it. And then the next week, there's another episode. More word of mouth spread. People go, oh, it's really good. Okay, I'll go back and start with episode one. They watch number two. Then the third episode comes out. And we've seen happen with Gen V, what we saw happen with The Boys, what we saw happen with WandaVision, what we saw happen with Mandalorian season one. We see week after week, the viewership gets higher and higher and higher and higher if you've got a good show. I, I often bring this up, but it's a good example. I go back to uh, Punisher season two which I loved Punisher season two. Everybody at the time was excited about it and it came out and it was great. And three or four days later, nobody was talking about it anymore. No questions came in about it because ah, it's old news. Now the whole series dropped. Everybody watched it already. Whereas something like this, we're seeing that the adventures of Marie and all the kids at uh, Godolkin university in the world of Gen V, it's just getting higher and higher, which makes my heart happy because I absolutely adore this show. And I'm going to be really interested to see where it ends up once the actual reports for week four, five, and six come out uh, with all that. And we're heading into its final episode next week. So you still got time to so get caught up on Gen V before next week's uh, season finale. And man, did this did last night's episode end on a banger. So good. Anyway, uh, Chris, you see the numbers. Mm -hmm. You're seeing what's happened here. Uh, how much of this is, you know, what it says in the report that Nielsen is pointing out that, hey, look, uh, this is yet more proof that the staggered releasing works better. We've seen Netflix. They're doing a quasi staggered release with their new uh, Squid Game show. They're going to be released over three weeks. They've done that with Stranger Things. They're doing that with The Crown. They did it with Lucifer. Is this an inevitability that we're heading that way? And, and how big up the chart do you think a Gen V can get? What do you think? Oh, I absolutely think most things are going to switch to weekly releases or at least some hybrid model like we've seen with Stranger Things or other things like that. You know, I remember, I think it was earlier in the year or last year, uh, Bella Balaharia, I believe that's her name, uh, chief content officer at the time for uh, Netflix, was at a UCLA event talking about how there was no data to support how weekly releases were more uh, enjoyable for consumers than, than the weekly release. And I just wonder, Netflix, why are you so recalcitrant to try things? Why do you always have to drag your feet? Because I know you guys created this new streaming model, essentially, right? They were the first in the game. But whenever new data is presented to them, I feel like it takes them the longest time to go, yep, yep, we should do this instead. And when you look at things like Stranger Things, when you look at things like The Boys, or Gen V, rather, on Amazon, 
the proof is in the pudding. People keep talking about your show and that's what matters. You know, we've brought up this example before too, you on Netflix, you know, that's a show that people talk about for a week and then never again until it right, comes until back. the next season comes out. And you want your shows to be water cooler moments. I know most of us work from home now, but you still want that water cooler thing of talking to your colleagues, talking to your friends of, oh my gosh, did you watch this week's episode? Oh, dude, it is nuts. It's going to be so wild once you get to watch it. That's part of the marketing strategy is creating that hype around the show and having other viewers tell you, oh my gosh, you have to watch this and building up crescendoing that viewership. That can only happen if you were doing this on a weekly release. Otherwise, you can't get excited about stuff. You pick a day to just kind of be a slob, maybe pop a gummy, eat some ice cream and watch 12 <laughs> episodes of something. That doesn't sound like a bad day. It's not a bad day. It's a great way to spend a Sunday. Highly recommend. But after it, church, obviously, after I go to mass, John, I then do this and wipe all the ash off of me from going into a church, you know, uh, but I don't I don't understand why more people aren't doing it. I think this is what the future gummies. holds. We're going to go. Gummies? <laughs> gummies? I, I feel like a lot of people are doing this, right? But by the way, Ray brought up a really good point about uh, the gummies? other day. You did when we were talking about you remember recently, I think it was either earlier this week or late last week. That report came out that said today or in 2019, 10 percent of streaming subscribers were churners. Like they'd watch a show that they want to watch, then cancel the subscription, then resubscribe when something else came on, right? That number went from in 2019, 10% to 2023, 33%. It tripled in just a couple of years. And they're projecting that by 2025, it could be 50% of streaming subscribers are gonna be churning. And Ray brought up a point, uh, I can't remember if it was on camera or off camera saying, you know, this is another reason why somebody like Netflix should go to the week to week release like uh, House of Usher just ended. Right. If they just dropped that as a binge. OK, so if somebody was really interested in House of Usher, a churner would go, OK, yeah, I'll, I'll watch House of Usher. They sign up to Netflix, watch House of Usher. There, I'm done. Unsubscribe. But you release episodes weekly of House of Usher. You've now got that subscriber for two months and then hopefully you've got other good shows that are running too at the same time so and that end, could be a way to combat the churn and they end up forgetting about their subscription and then and they forget but, they but, but like a gym unless membership. they have rocket money yeah unless oh, that's right oh, oh, done. Nice sponsor oh. Shout out. Here's Very good. i think someone at netflix still believes that they can't possibly watch the whole season in one night no without when people cutting their cables <clears> off they have nothing to watch but what you put out so i think that maybe them believing that oh they're, they're not going to watch the whole thing we can still drop it all they're not everyone's going to finish it in one night or one two days i know many people who would do, who would finish a series oh and yeah it's many people I, I, almost everybody i know if they start watching a bingeable show mm -hmm. they'll finish a season in two three or four days and then yeah. they'll be done as opposed to two months and the added buzz of continued word of mouth from episode to episode to episode, bringing in new viewers, it's ultimately going to be what they, as churning increases, it's going to be something they have to look at, not just for how much better it is for your shows, but I think maybe for the survival of the streamer, they're going to have to start looking at that too. Anyway, all right, guys, with that down, let's move on to the single most exciting piece of news this week. <laughs> for you. For me, <laughs> damn right. Because one of my top 10 greatest films of all time, yes, you heard me say it, one of my top 10 all-time greatest films ever, The Highlander, with Christopher Lambert, Sean Connery, the great Clancy Brown. They've been talking for a long time about doing a remake. Now, back in the day, back in the AMC days, actually, back in the movie blog days, there was talks that Ryan Reynolds was attached to do a Highlander remake. For years, he was attached to that. Then that kind of went away. Then a couple of years ago, oh, what's this? Some whispers started going out that Henry Cavill, with John Wick director John Stahelski, was going to be looking at rebooting The Highlander. And they keep talking about it. And Chad, the director, has kept talking about it and kept talking about it. That's all it's ever been. Just a lot of talk. Well, now, today, ladies and gentlemen, Mark this on your calendar. October 27th, 2023 is the day that it became real. Because according to Deadline, this thing's now official. All right, so from Deadline, in the world of Highlander reboots, there can still only be one, and then another one, and then another one. And it's a good one at that. 
For the first time, Lionsgate will be launching sales at the American film market on their long gestating fantasy reboot, which has Henry Cavill aboard to star as the Scottish swordsman and uh, John Wick filmmaker Chad Stahelski set to direct. We hear this will be a big budget proposition north of a $100 million budget. Zahelski himself has previously talked about about it uh, as akin to John Wick with swords. The team is eyeing a 2024 start date. So they're actually out there selling this movie now at the the AFM, which is super great. The money is changing hands, which means they've got a script. The script must be done if they're now already eyeing start a production on this thing. And Henry Cavill coming in to play the Heiner. Now, look, before I saw Henry Cavill in The Witcher, I thought he was perfect to be the new Connor McLeod. Seeing him as Geralt of Rivia only deepened my belief that he is perfect to pay Connor McLeod or the Clan McLeod. Uh, Now, one of the big questions that will be for me, though, well, two of the big questions are both casting decisions. Who plays Sean Connery's role as Ramirez? Who do you get to come in and play that? And then the second, equally as important one is, who plays Clancy Brown's The Kurgan? Because you got to have a great Kurgan. Henry Cavill's going to be able to step in. Now, Christopher Lambert did, did, did a great job playing this role. He was fabulous, despite the fact that I believe he was a Frenchman playing yeah. a Frenchman <laughs> playing a Scottish. That's and, and, I'm so confused about this movie, and John. And a Scottishman playing, playing a an Spaniard. Egyptian Spaniard. Yes. <laughs> like what? Yeah. And then only to be more confused about Christopher Lambert then going on to play Lord Raiden in uh, Mortal Kombat. Mortal Kombat. That was even yeah. a little bit more confused. But he was great as Connor McLeod of the Clan McLeod. I. I'm so bloody excited for this. A modern retelling of this story with modern technique. I They don't have to do it. It's fine if they don't. But my God, if they can keep the Queen soundtrack <gasps> perfection incarnate. I don't know. Ray, what do, you, what do you think? I don't know what this franchise is about. I don't know who they cast in those things. But the thing I like about it is that the John Wick director is at the yeah as a, that 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 interests me. I like it that it's at Lionsgate too. They seem to pop like action movies. They seem to do very well over there. Yep. Um, I just can't wait to see what they do with a sword this time. It's it's a sword. His weapon is a sword now, right? Well, no. So so this is this is the the basic idea. This is the mythology of the Highlander. Okay, throughout history, every once in a while, an immortal is born, and whenever immortals come across each other, they can recognize that they're immortals. And if you cut off the other immortal's head, you gain their power. Basically. Uh, because it's, it's because they're aliens. The quickening, right? It's because they're aliens. No, no forget. No, no shut, it's because they're you aliens. You shut your fucking dirty <laughs> mouth. <laughs> you shut <laughs> your whore mouth. I don't know. Right <laughs> now, we do not talk about the Highlander because 2. Because the Highlander 2. It does oh, not exist. It. <laughs> they renounced it. You shut up. Anyway, so there's... I need to watch Highlander too. There's no, no, you don't. I've never you been really more excited don't. to watch a movie, Ray. Let's so, go. Here's the thing. So, but they all know, somehow, they just know, instinctually, they know that at some time in the future, they're going to all feel drawn to one place where they will finally battle it out. That sounds Because cool. there can be only one. That sounds And then cool. the Alien. last survivor will oh. get what's called the oh, prize. But none of them know what that is, what the prize is. And so Mark. it follows Connor McCloud from the old Highlander days all the way through history and going up, leading up to the uh, to the gathering. Get Dwayne Johnson as the other. As the Kurgan? Well, that wouldn't be Dwayne a bad Johnson, idea. Hey, that's a great, he would be because great yeah. as the Kurgan. never got their fight in uh, Black Adam and Superman. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> we can finally get our hands in. <laughs> Let's Adam. do it. Come on. Oh. All joking aside, he would be a great Kurgan. Dwayne Johnson would be Let's awesome. Let's do as it. But I'm, but I'm still kind of, who Don't. plays Ramirez? Oh. Do you think there could be a role for, uh, I almost said for John Wick, for Keanu Reeves in this somewhere? No, that would would he be too distracting? <laughs> I mean, you, he could be a Ramirez. I guess, I guess John, but I don't think he's quite old enough to be Ramirez. I mean, listen, like how old is Keanu now? 55, 56? 50, yeah, he was, something like that. Or is he getting, getting look up his age, something yeah. like that. I think he's at least minimum mid 50s. At this point, I don't think he's quite old enough to play Ramirez. Uh, then it becomes the 59. question. Fifty-nine. Yeah, fifty-nine. So he's almost sixty. Damn, Keanu. Yeah, Keanu's almost sixty. Dang. So then, 
of course, it there was, was a pretty good, a, a pretty good TV series called The Highlander, where that focuses on Connor's cousin, mm -hmm. Duncan McLeod. So then that brings in the question: Could you have a Duncan McLeod in the movie? And uh, I, I don't know. I could see Carl Urban maybe as a a new version of. Duncan McLeod. I don't know. Anyway, Chris, mm. uh, as somebody who is so well versed in this. the lore of Highlander, <laughs> as someone who went, "What's it, Kurgan? <laughs> What's it, Kurgan? <laughs> what do you think about this news?" As, as somebody, who, as listen, this is an old film. I'm sure there's yeah. a lot of people watching who've never seen the Highlander. But mm. does this appeal to you? What do you think about the sounds of this? It definitely appeals to me. I love that Henry Cavill is just living out his nerd dreams. Just yeah, like, I want to. I want to be the Highlander. I want to make a Warhammer movie. I want to do whatever I want and talk about, uh, you know. A Polish book that I really enjoy. Not the video game, the <laughs> Polish book. He's such a nerd. I love it. It's amazing to see him conquer the world. I am curious how people keep feeling about an iconic Scottish character not being played by a Scotsman, though. Just because, you know, there are feelings about the English, certainly. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least at least he's from closer to Scotland than Christopher than Lambert. France by way of Long so, Island. But I think um, the Scots prefer... The French, probably, the British, probably. based on history. So, yeah. so. so tell me something. In, in the Highlander movies, what does the Highlander do? What is the Highlander doing in between time before finding the... Or is it the whole thing about searching for that other immortal? No, no, no. So, like, is basically, there's... he's just living... Like, Connor, the, this, the character Connor, is living through time. Mm -hmm. Some are more evil. They're going out hunting other immortals. Connor's just trying to live his life. He's accumulating wealth. He's gone from love to love. So, life. so he's in, he's embracing being an immortal, right? Then. Yes, but he's he's not going out and about and trying to find, be become the strongest. He's just doing. No, he's like, just yeah, he's just trying to survive like everybody thing. else. Like he's got other immortals that are his friends, even though, oh. even though. Even if you're friends, you know at some point in the future, whether it's five years or a hundred years I or two hundred years from now, you're going to have to battle until there's only one. Just like all friendship. Just like all friendships. Just like that Survivor. Really yeah. cool, actually. You guys, oh God, you guys it's don't so plan good. To chop off the heads of your friends. Mm -hmm. And then the second movie came, that ruined everything. Tell me about it, Jonathan. But then, <laughs> then the third movie came out <laughs> that basically said, "Remember the second movie." We don't either. It didn't happen. The second movie didn't happen, everybody. And they just like retconned the second movie. Which one movie was entirely. Endgame? Highlander Endgame. Which one was that one? Was that the fourth one or fifth one? Because that's think, the only I, one I saw. I think that's the one that had Duncan in it with Connor. I think that was, yeah, the fourth, wasn't it? Yeah, it might have been the fourth. The third one had Mario Van Peebles <laughs> in it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I told you what we did, right, for Endgame or what me and Ryan and uh, Tommy and us No, did. it was that. We, because we knew Edge was in in the movie, like in the beginning, like the WWE wrestler. So we went, we saw his part. He 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 got killed like in the first what five minutes. In which movie? And then we left. <laughs> in which movie? Highlander Endgame. Is Edge in that? Yeah. I totally didn't even remember that. <laughs> totally didn't even remember that. All right. Guys, with that down, we are now going to move over and start taking your questions. Uh, it, we still have the Super Chats open, by the way. We will, for, but only for the next couple of minutes. So if you do have a topic or question you want to send in, fire that in now. But before we get to them, we're going to take another moment and thank the other sponsor, the main sponsor of the John Campus Show YouTube channel, my mobile service provider, and they should be yours, Mint Mobile. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of today's video, Mint Mobile. Signing your life away to a big wireless provider is kind of like being trapped on a roller coaster from hell. Sure, it looks like fun at first. They probably even threw in a free phone, but now you can't get off. Month after month of insane bills and unexpected thrills, like overages and surprise fees. If that sounds like your current big wireless plan, it's time to get off the ride with Mint Mobile. For a limited time, wireless plans from Mint Mobile are just $15 a month. That's unlimited talk, text, and data for just 15 bucks a month. You guys know before I came to Mint Mobile, I was paying triple what I am paying now on the standard big wireless plan, and I will never go back. All plans come with unlimited talk, text, and high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and bring your phone number along with all your existing contacts. To get your new unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped right to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash campia. That's mintmobile.com dot com slash campia cut your wireless bill to just 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash campia and thank you to our friends at mint mobile for sponsoring this episode 
Okay, guys, with that down, let's get over to your questions here, shall we? We'll start off with the Super Chats. Chris, what do we got up first? From James Wheeler sending in a $20 oh, Super thank Chat. thank you, James. Hey, James certain strong. Hello, everyone. Tomorrow, I'm going to see David Fincher's The Killer. I'll be going to Alamo Draft House for the first time to see it. <gasps> I, will de- I, I don't know how similar all the Alamo Draft Houses are. I know mm-hmm. the one in L.A. is quite nice. I really do like mm-hmm. the L.A. one. Um, yeah, The Killer... The first trailer came out for it, I didn't love. Then the second trailer came out. I'm like, okay, now I'm on board. And I think today the final trailer came out. Uh, of course, Michael Fassbender starring in this thing. There is no actor in Hollywood who needs, like really needs a really good movie more than Michael Fassbender does. Uh, and he deserves it. He's such a great talent. So I, I'm really looking forward to this one. And I hope you have a good time. And if it's like the Alamo Draft House we've got in LA and the one that they have in Austin... It's a really good viewing experience. It's kind of the way that a lot of movie going experiences should be. I hope you have a really good time at it, man. Get some deep fried pickles. Ugh. They're the best. Oh, oh, I don't want to hear that from you at all. I hate pickles, but it's dairy. Only- Actually, dairy. You know That's the only you know way what? I can eat a pickle is deep I tr- fried. It's so good. I, yeah, I tried I them, like them and they're not bad. They're not bad. It Does it make them the not taste like it. pickles? I mean, it tastes like it's deep fried. Everything tastes better deep it fried. Just oh, kinda, that's true. Yeah. Even it brings it down. Yeah. It mellows it. It does. All right, what's next? From Rafael Castillo, regarding the Highlander remake, Lord Spare, Lord Spare Me the Crybabies ranting, there can only be one. Yeah, I mean, look, which is fine if you're it's rebooting. I mean, it is one. funny by the time you get to the fourth film and the third television show saying there can be only one. Um, yeah, it, yeah, true. But this is the first one. This is technically the first. This yes. is the start. So we'll see where they go. All right, what's next? From uh, Lavardov, John, here I thought uh, Dean Shetty was another evil character in this universe. What an impressive character turn. Oh. That made sense. Gen V is too good. I, I, oh my God. Every character is so deep and so rich. And what they did with Dean Shetty, who is, I know, see, see if you can find a picture of her, uh, Jonathan. So Dean Shetty so from rich. Gen V. But like, you're just thinking just another evil, just an evil manipulative uh, you know, character, right? And then Gen V does what the world that, uh... of the boys does. Yeah, she's the dean of the school. They do what they do. They give, they suddenly plunge you into this amazing depth to the character. You know what they did? You saw the, the boys season one, right? Yes. Well, Dean Shetty is, has been like a master manipulator. She's evil, all this kind of stuff running the school. Uh, she's human. She's not a soup. And then they introduce in last night's episode a callback to one of my favorite episodes of television ever, the episode where Highlander, Highlander, uh, <laughs> Homelander and Queen Maeve were on that plane. Yeah, it turns out her wife and child were on that plane. And she has a plan to kill all, to commit genocide and kill all soups. And you find out in this, it's because of this. And, and all of a sudden, like in that one moment, like you just look at this character so differently and they're, they're, the hurt and the pain and you realize what has brought her to this moment. It's that kind of deep, great character work that always makes these shows so compelling and so great. And uh, yeah, it just made me appreciate her character even more. God, I, I love yeah. her in the show. Love her I need to show. catch up. I, I watched Loki instead last night because, you know, I, I've got I'm a pumpkin. I go to sleep before. <laughs> It gets dark yeah. out. <laughs> I was planted in front of the TV yesterday because I watched. Did you do five, five Nights? I did Five Nights at Freddy's mm-hmm. and then did Loki mm-hmm. and then did Gen V. Damn. <laughs> it was a lot of TV watching last night. Was and it, then a little bit of football. Was it a good TV watching for well, them? Oh, it, no. But not the first <laughs> No, Five Nights at Freddy's was not so good. Oh, no. It wasn't so bad. Okay. Like, it wasn't like. But you I, ended I your night strong. I didn't come away from it thinking okay. that was awful. Mm-hmm. It feels like it's made. It feels like it's somebody's first movie. Like, it, oh, it re- okay. like, just you can tell, like, this is a not experienced director. I don't know who directed it, mm-hmm. but you it could, was Emma. Emma It something. just felt like somebody was not experienced at directing. And it's like, huh, there's only three adults in this movie. I wonder who could be the bad guy. Um, it's not great. Mm-hmm. Not terrible. Loki was fantastic. I loved Loki. I loved Loki uh, last night. But Gen V again for me stole the night. Okay. Like, yeah. Oh. At the movie theater, there were little kids dressed up as the Five Nights characters, which was adorable and awful. They're going to get you. Which, if you, when you see them, oh, you you saw the movie. I didn't see the movie. I went and saw saw Nightmare Before Christmas. Oh, that'd be (laughs) There were a bunch of six year olds Mm -hmm. who were braver than me. Also, but also questionable parenting. 
<laughs> no, no, no. Let's not forget that South Park also dropped a new episode. Watch it. It came out. Yeah, Ray's been Paramount raving Plus. about oh, this South Park thing all day. Yeah. So hopefully everyone can check that out too. All right. What's next? For Rom, seconds from disaster. I said it last week, and I'll say it again. Miss Minutes is an effing uh, psychopath, and I love it. Yeah, what when they she started showing teeth, in, uh, in her smile. Oh, I was like, oh, mm-hmm. listen, there. I don't like it. The 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 most descriptive thing they've ever done with Miss Minutes to get us to really look into the head of yeah. Miss Minutes was something they did oh, last man. night without any dialogue. They're murdering a bunch of people, and she's standing back doing this. Oh my god! And it's like, I you just learned more about the character of Miss Minutes in two seconds with no dialogue, than in all of Loki season one and season two, as she's watching these people being murdered. And she's like, she's getting turned on by it. Like it's, woo, Miss Minutes, ladies and gentlemen. All right, what's next? From Dwayne Fernandez, if Marvel can keep making variants very different characters, Victor Timely versus Kang, I wouldn't mind the multiverse shenanigans and deaths. No, it's just stupid. Multiverse is just stupid. <laughs> Ray showed me one clip of South last night's South Park to me, and I am convinced the guys at South Park just stole this from me. <laughs> but it's, it was, uh, who is it? Kyle. Kyle. It was Kyle going, I'm tired of this multiverse bullshit. It's just an excuse for lazy writing. It's like, yeah, I've been saying that for years. No, I, I hate, it's it's just, no, multiverse is stupid. I can't wait for them to wrap that up. All right, what's next? <laughs> From Jesse Roy, which lawyer would you have on your side? Jennifer Walters, Harvey Specter, or Matt Murdock? Harvey Specter. Yeah, no, Who's sorry. Harvey like, Specter? yeah, I love Matt, Like, duh, but like the most ruthless, the best closer there is Harvey Specter. For those of you who don't know what we're talking about, Harvey Specter is the, uh, one of the two main characters in the number one show on the planet for like six years running now <laughs> suits uh harvey specter 100 percent, 100 percent. all right what's next matt murdoch because maybe we'll fall in love uh, <laughs> he michael- tends to do that a lot <laughs> right? a lot michael robert maximilian moriarty loki once again truly made this multi made this the multiverse saga this alongside the mutant reveal of ms marvel and the birth of the scarlet witch is peak disney plus oh this is one of two um, oh, yeah, there we go. There. Also, the music when the loom and the timeline exploded was the same theme from the Kang Dynasty Secret Wars reveal back at Comic Con last year. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Honestly, the multi the multiverse stuff in Loki season two has been minor at best. Like just a little dash of multiverseism here, a little dash of it here. Uh, to be quite honest with you, using it so sparingly makes it more effective. Mm-hmm. Like that one scene as, as Loki's walking down the hallway and then sees himself from episode one. That was great. I that, don't think he's that's see a himself. very good use yeah. of something like that, right? That makes you start to think in, in that term. That was a really good use of it. I, I enjoyed that. Got to say this too. And this is not a reflection on anything going on with Jonathan Majors' court problem. So that's completely aside, all right? God, he's good in this show. Yeah. The, 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 the personality he's given Victor Timely is so good even his reactions to hot cocoa like uh, just uh, cocoa he, oh, oh my god he's so good he so. just he manifests this character i i really really do like him in this show a lot mm. all right what's next from tim platt loki season two in my opinion is proof that when marvel gets it right they crush it this is everything i want in a tv series they stick the landing and it is definitely one of my favorite shows i I don't know that I'd go that far. Like I have really enjoyed Loki season two so far. Like I, like it's definitely one of the, one of the better MCU shows that they've done so far. I don't think it's been like, it's not going to be in my top 20 all time favorite shows period, but it's been really good so far. And, and I quite enjoy, I still don't think it's quite as good. Well, I don't think it's nearly as good as WandaVision was. I don't think it's quite as good as Ms. Marvel, but other, it, it feels nice to when talking about MCU shows on Disney Plus that I like, to be able to mention another one other than just Ms. Marvel and WandaVision. Yeah. Like, finally being able to say another one, and I think Loki Season 2 is that for me. But you're right. With the ending they had on the episode yesterday, this could go really badly or really epic ending. And Disney Plus does not have a great track record of sticking the landing. But I'm going to hope for the best, fingers crossed. Let's see what they do with it next week. Again, 
By the way, six episodes is bullshit. Uh, what is this nonsense? Anyway, all right, what's next? <laughs> From Bobby Jackson. Finally watched the new Frasier series, and I'm happy to say it's pretty good. Not as sharp and witty as the original, but still decent. I've heard nothing but good things about the new Frasier, which I, I'm very excited to get around to start watching it at some point. I think they're on their fourth episode now or something like that, which is such a relief because I got turned off a lot because I was really excited about Night Court coming back. I was really excited about Night Court coming back. That show sucks. Oh my God, it's so bad. And it kind of killed the idea of these relaunches and revisit shows for me. But I've heard nothing but good stuff about Frasier, so I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to checking it out. All right, what's next? From Dr. Stinky, I want... Mm. Oh, that's that's a callback to something Ray. No, that another right another writer wrote in the other day talking about a figure he got. He got I got 19 inches of venom. I'm like, okay, wow. well, you do you, brother. You don't even have to be in the same room. You yeah. do you, my <laughs> friend. Wow, yeah. you actually can't. Right. What's next? <laughs> you did the math. <laughs> <laughs> Matt reads, as a Potterhead, the story of Fantastic Beasts didn't work for me in terms of prequels. I'd be interested in learning about how the first Wizarding War began. I mean, look, I would also be interested in going further back than that. I'd be interested in seeing like the foundation of Hogwarts. Like I've read a little bit of the, uh, of the lore behind it about these wizards who came together, the ones who represented the house of Slytherin and, mm -hmm. uh, Gryffindor. Okay. Wait, like, okay. Let me see if I can do it. Slytherin, Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, Slytherin, Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, and Ravenclaw. 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 Oh. Okay, sorry. So I almost had it. Almost had it. I got three out of the four. That's where all the smart kids go. I'd be interested in seeing that. Like the, that, I, the foundation of Hogwarts. Sure, I'd see that. By the way, <laughs> the video game, I think the video game is still the number one selling video game of the year. That, that Hogwarts legacy. Really? I think that's yeah. still like the number one money grosser <laughs> game. So last of the weekend year. was nutso butso for video game releases. So I'm interested to see what those yeah. numbers are. Nutso but butso. I mean, clearly, butso. people are into Hogwarts. Yeah. They'd love to that's see more about booty. Hogwarts. It's better so. than booty. <laughs> better than booty. All right, what's next? Have you had booty? <laughs> well, Ray, Ray you will cannot talk ask camera. some people that question. <laughs> <laughs> when you were going through. Uh, Hogwarts, I'm going to tell on him. When you're doing through ho the Hogwarts, uh, Hufflepuff, uh, Slytherin, he goes Sniper Wolf. No. Oh. <laughs> no, I said Snaggletooth. Uh, I thought you said House Sniper Wolf. But that's even better. The Snipe Sniper House Wolf. Sniper Wolf. The House of Sniper House, Wolf. Yeah. Where you just go around telling everybody else where other people live. <laughs> it's All right. What's next? Comfort. Oh my God. <laughs> From Bobby Jackson again. Love Gen V last night. Do you think they're setting up two of the female characters as the Professor X and Magneto of this universe? Maybe. I mean, listen, <laughs> I. what they're doing with Sam, I think is really, really interesting. And they clearly took, last night's episode clearly took a little bit of an X-Men turn. It definitely did. But but it didn't feel forced to me because I've actually been watching like when I got into the boys season two and three, I've been kind of wondering like, this is like, you just see, it's like, this should be turning into an X-Men situation because of what's happening in their world. And to see it now starting to manifest a little bit, it kind of makes sense. All right. What's next from Christopher Brickner. If we get two star Wars films in 2026, like planned, what would the second one be? It was rumored to be Filoni's film, but it needs more shows like Mandalorian season four to lead into it, and the strikes cause delays. Does it? Yeah, I don't think Does so. Does it need more shows to lose more popularity? Yeah. Ooh. Before a movie comes out? Look, I, I'm that's that's the statistics. The, the numbers don't lie. I mean, it, it's, it's been fair, losing popularity. But it's still, oh, right? damn. Like you, you we saw that uh, like Ahsoka, forty percent less viewers on their season finale than their debut which was uh, already a big drop from Mandalorian season three, which itself was a big drop from Mandalorian season two. I, I mean, you keep running it at some point, there's going to be nothing to make a movie about. So I would almost think they need, to, if they, if they still going to do this movie, I think you don't make any more shows to run the, that you're running the risk of just lessening the popularity of it. And it's already not that popular. So I, I, then again, I really don't know that this Filoni movie is going to happen. I, I don't think the Filoni movie is going to happen. Let, let me rephrase that. I think Filoni will definitely get a live action movie to do. I don't know if this Filoni Mandoverse 
movie will happen. At some point, Dave Filoni will get a live action movie. I just don't know if it'll be this Mandoverse one. All right, what's next? From Damaris Love, well, Victor Timely Spaghetti, anyone? <laughs> I think he means like, well, Victor Timely Spaghetti, oh, anyone? Oh, oh, yeah, that's right. What happens to him? Yeah, yeah that was kind of shocking to me, that actually. Was gnarly. I, but I, I wasn't expecting that. I'm still not sold that that was radiation that did that. Yeah. And I'm, I think that's him getting split into a multiverse or something like that. Because when it was happening to Loki, he was burning away. He just but that's because it was spaghetti. slow. That's because it was slow. I know, but that was also the same effect they used on Mr. Fantastic when uh, I was about Scarlet to say, Witch. I was about to say it's it's Scarlet Witch. Yeah. Scarlet Witch did it. Mm, yes. Because that's what she did to Mr. Fantastic. Yep. Just spaghetti mm. him up. <laughs> All right, what's next? From Bike Man. Planet Earth 3 trailer dropped, and oh my god. Planet Earth <laughs> 2 trailer is why I got into wildlife filming. Cinema comes in different forms, and this is cinema. Yeah, Long absolutely. live Attenborough. Hi from Halif. Halif? Every, I'm not going to lie Halif? to you. Every once in a while, Bike Man, I go down a nature video rabbit hole on YouTube. And a lot of it is David Attenborough <laughs> like stuff. I particularly like, I don't know why, I love cheetah videos. Love cheetahs. Actually, Anna and I were just watching, there's this guy called the cheetah guy. Oh, the cheetah he, guy, huh? He literally not to be goes into the these girls. habitats and like he sleeps with them. Like they all they all curl up on the him like dogs. Guy. Like oh, they, they try to sleep on his head and they, they, they curl like, so right up to him. Guy. And they purr like a Harley Davidson when they purr. They're purr, like it's really loud. And he, said, and he says, when they lick you, he says, it's really quite painful because their tongues are designed to like, yeah. like grab stuff and pull it in. So this is very like abrasive, with, but they love grooming him. And, and I just, and I love watching their hunt videos and stuff like that. But mm. David Attenborough's nature videos are great, especially when something's getting killed. All right. <laughs> Ray does not like those Whoa. at all. All right, what's next? From Spidey83, a.k.a. Curtis Spriggs. Apologies to Chris Carr. I mistook her for Danica Hart and Miles Morales, and in playing of Spider-Man 2, they actually showed the character, and it's not. Yeah, it's not man. you. I know it's not me. <laughs> it's not you. Get over it, okay? Was there an argument about that? No, was there a I was just like, no, that? I'm not in that game. No, I'm pretty sure you are. Pretty sure you are. <laughs> I, I would have liked to be. <laughs> that would have been me. All right, what's next? Uh, from Damaris Love. Oh, I can see this, too. De Bautista as the Kurgan. Maybe. Oh, mm. you know what? That's yes. hundred percent. Yes. You know why? Because as great as Clancy Brown was in the role of the Kurgan, there's not a lot of dimension to Kurgan. It's, it's a, it's kind of, and I mean this, about, it is a one note <laughs> character. It is. It's a yeah, one note yeah, character. Yeah. And I think Dave Bautista could own that. I think he could be in there and be this grizzled, like psychopath, murderous killer, this Kurgan wheel. i that would be great. I would, you know, he would, he would yeah. be my number one choice. He would be my number one choice to play that role. All right, what's next? From Walter White Walker, Antonio Banderas Ramirez. Not Momoa, opposed to that either. The Kurgan. Ooh. Oh, sorry, who is the Kurgan? Momoa. Oh, Momoa. I love Momoa as an actor. You know what? I probably would have loved that suggestion if I didn't just hear the Dave Batista as Kurgan. Yeah, yeah. I'd rather Dave Batista, but I'm not opposed to Banderas as Ramirez. Antonio Banderas as. No, you you crushed it. You just you nailed it, Antonio Banderas, and not just because he was puss in boots, but Antonio but Banderas as Ramirez, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Feel me mostly. if you dare. Mostly. Yeah, he'd be great. That's yeah. a good suggestion. All right, what's next? From Alpha, uh, Gen V released the first three episodes at once. Yep. So the success of episode three really has more to do with quality, not the staggered release, although it's best. Um, I think. What you're gonna find the way Nielsen splits it up, they describe the way it, the way they do the whole thing, um, and I think it was week three that they did. It wasn't just episode three; it was week three. But here's the thing about the dropping all three things at once. This is something I think more streamers have to do, and we've seen a number of them do it with certain shows. Where when they're debuting a show, instead of dropping the first episode, they'll drop the first two or sometimes the first three. I think that's vital. Because you want with somebody's first engagement with your show to get hooked. And it's easier to get them hooked, number one, if your show's good. But it's easier to get them hooked if you get them a, give them a little bit larger of a sample size, right? So you're more likely to get somebody hooked if you give them two episodes off the bat, give them a better sense of the show, where's the show going, what is the show going to be, than if you just drop the first. And I think that is something they're going to continue to do 
they've done it before with the boys. I think other series, like in as much as I think Netflix needs to move to a week to week release, I still do kind of like the idea of dropping the first two, first three episodes of a new show, particularly right off the top. All right. What's next? From, uh, oh, uh, Lovardov. Also, who do you think uh, Rainer was talking to on the phone? Which member of the boys will show up? Seems like it could be Butcher. I doubt it's Butcher. I doubt it's going to be Billy Butcher who shows up in that. I have, if anything, I think it probably could be Huey. But, I mean, I'm not really sure. It might also not be any of them. It might not be any of the characters that we're already familiar with. It could be somebody else entirely. I love seeing that she popped up, though. You know what's great about it? When they do these cameos from the boys, they're not gratuitous. They're not just like, there was no purpose for that person to suddenly make an appearance. Then bringing her in, in that scene, perfectly fit the story. It made sense that the Dean would go to her, right? That narratively makes sense. So it wasn't just like, hey, everybody, look, it's another character from the boys. No, it was somebody who, it would have felt weird if she wasn't there. And I like the way they've been they kind of handle that. All right, what's next? From Spencer Smothers. I absolutely loved this episode of Loki. Episodes one and four were directed by Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead. Two amazing episodes, in my opinion. I'm so excited to see the two will direct the last two episodes of Loki. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, it's in television, it's more about the script than it is about the directors. But it's still good to see. Um, yeah, I hope they nail the ending. I really, really do. I'm going to be really, because I've really enjoyed this episode or this season of Loki way more than season one. And it's going to break my little heart if they really crap the ending. So here's hoping. Strong belief. All right. What's next? From Red One Real Talk. Did you see any parallels between Gen V and the X-Men? Yep. Particularly after last night's episode and the preview for the next one, I see a budding Magneto versus Professor X type of clash that I never expected to get from this series. Yeah. I mean, look, listen, we've, inevitably you had to believe like once they started introducing the world of the boys that the soup population uh was a legitimate sized one that at some point when is this going to become a soups versus humanity kind of thing and last night was the first time they really brought that in and and instead of feeling like an X-Men ripoff is what I always feared it could be it felt like the natural progression of what this world is and they did it very well. And the way they took a couple of characters, you know, Sam and Claire, and I mean, it could become a really, really, it's going to be interesting to see where they go with the finale. All right, what's next? From Disgraceful and Loki season two is blowing my expectations out of the water so far. Hopefully they stick at the landing. Plus Miss Minutes is a certified psychopath. She Listen, is. that end, the ending of last night's episode really gives them a clean sh sheet to do whatever they want with the finale. They can do w whatever they want to do. I mean, because everybody's dead. So where do you go or next? What happens now? So it, again, that means it could be really cool and creative or it could be really ridiculous and stupid. I mean, we've seen, we've already seen set Pete like photos. So we know like there's still like a scene where they're at like a water ski or a jet ski sales office and so I'm wondering if everyone I don't just, remember that. Yeah, they were released a while ago, but I'm wondering if this is just like everyone was shoved onto a timeline. I don't know. Ooh. Well, remember, because they've one of the running themes in the season has been, hey, Mo uh, Mobius, you've never even gone to check out to see if you're where your regular life is and stuff like that. Maybe the next episode of it seems something weird to do in your finale, though. Right. I don't know. Maybe maybe that's the ending of his story. We'll see here. Fingers crossed. All right. What's next? From King Daddy Goat. Hey guys, hope everyone's having a great day. Man, that Loki episode last night. <laughs> that was intense. Do you think it's possible that we find out Obi is actually a Kang variant? No. It's making more and more sense to me. Thanks and bring on the filthy. I think they explained it very well in last night's episode. It's a chicken and the egg thing, but they're not both the chicken and the egg. So no, I don't think Obi is... Because remember, every Kang variant we saw, every Kang variant we saw was Jonathan Majors in at the end of uh, Ant-Man of the Wasp, Quantumania. So I don't think there's any reason to believe they're suddenly such a different one. And they really did a good job explaining how one did come before the other. So no, I don't think he's going to end up being a Kang variant. It'd be a really cool Ra's al Ghul kind of thing to do, though. Of like, but actually. <laughs> yeah. 
Wait, I mean, they won't. I <laughs> forgot I already told you that my middle name was Brownlee. Well, Mobius, I suppose you found out my secret, and all of a sudden, short round goes bad. Oh. Woo! It's so murdering people. I'd love it. All right, what's next? From CJ Rebirth. Yeah, Freddy's isn't a great movie, but I had a fun time experiencing it in theaters with a packed crowd. Glad to see my boy Josh Hutcherson in a movie again. Same. And the Henson Company nailed it with the animatronics. Um, I don't know that they nailed it with the animatronics. Oh, no. But the design of Freddy and his band was very good. The design was very, very, very good. The, the reason I say I don't know that they did a great job with the animatronics is because there really wasn't much movement, right? The, the movement was all very, so I, I don't know that they did, not that they did a bad job with the animatronics, just that they barely moved. But the design was peak right on, absolute peak right on. All right, what's next? From Major K25, just a thought, a wasted character that could appear in Marvel's Silver Surfer. But for why? I, I, why? What's the, what would be the point? What's the connection? Wasn't, didn't, didn't Rob and I talk about Silver Surfer getting a one-off thingy on Sometime. Disney Plus? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was something that was in the works? Yeah, I don't, I don't see it. I don't know if that's happening. I don't see it. I, I especially don't see them like Silver Surfer. There's just no connection to these characters. I, I just don't see that being it at all. Yeah. All right, what's next? From KW Garrett. Hi, John. You've talked about this before, but why doesn't AMC have a rule that allows for intermission breaks if a movie exceeds three hours in length? I bought tickets to Killers of the Flower Moon tonight, but considered canceling because four nonstop hours sitting in a chair sounds kind of awful. Listen, I've, I've been saying this for years, since the AMC days. I believe movie theaters should institute a 10 minute intermission in movies that are two and a half, say, set, set a number, let's say two hours and 45 minutes. If a movie is longer than two hours and 45 minutes, you should have a 10 minute intermission. It is a win, win, win for everybody. Because honestly, once you get over two hours and 45 minutes, you get into the three hour thing, you're gonna have a lot of people that at some point are gonna get up to go to the bathroom, right? And every time somebody gets up to go to the bathroom, that's pulling you out of the movie. It's like every time I got to scratch my knees back as somebody walks in front of me and then you got to do it again when they come back. And if so you get rid of that, it will reduce the number of people who take out their phones because they know there's an intermission coming when they go out and check their phones. It'll reduce the number of times people get up to go and get more snacks because there's going to be an intermission where they can go out to get snacks. It gives you an opportunity to stretch your legs a little bit, stuff like that. It'll be good for the theaters because they'll sell more concessions. It'll like, it's just, it just makes sense. And the boo-hoo, I don't want my movie interrupted. You watch stuff at home all the time that you hit pause 10 times during the movie to go and get a snack, go and use the bathroom. It won't ruin the movie for you to have it pause for a minute because you do it fucking all the time at home. So, yeah, I honestly, I do not see a single legitimate argument against saying, Two hours, 45 minutes, two hours, 50 minutes, three hours, whatever. Movies that are longer than this will have a mandatory 10-minute intermission. They, I just think it's better for everybody. They should have just shown Killers of the Flower Moon on any international flights. That's it. That's the only <laughs> place where they should have shown that movie. Where people are like, oh, four-hour movie. Let's That's do perfect. it. Perfect. All right. Well, last yeah, question so of the day. What's next? Ooh, last question. Uh, Jai, CSC, what Canadian national parks would you recommend for someone to visit? I don't even know the name of any national parks. <laughs> Canada uh, is just all parks. I'll give Canadian. It, yeah. No, I mean, we don't think Canada of those terms. Like in America, uh -huh. you guys have so few places that are worth visiting that you actually yeah. have to okay, designate John. them as national no, parks. There's so few places worth li uh, visiting. Well, that That's is, why we live here. I'm saying in Canada, it's just like, hmm. go anywhere. Everywhere in Canada oh, is a gorgeous, beautiful national park. It is. Yeah. It's the everywhere Canada. is beauty personified. Oh, okay. Like wherever you go, we don't have to say. If you're into woods, you don't, don't have seven hours shit. that way to get to whatever <laughs> national park. Jesus. Look, look, I'm not saying that Canada is better. I'm just saying that Canada is better. Okay. That's okay. All. But That's here, all how many trailer parks do you have? Banff. <laughs> Banff National Park. It's a national park in Canada. Banff. Go there. Ban well, see, but Banff, we don't Did even think about Banff American as a national school. That's impressive. We don't yeah, think of Banff as a national is. park. We just think of Banff, right? Banff, by the way, listen, you'll find a lot. World travelers will tell you this. Guys, 
Banff is the most beautiful place in the world. And and as somebody from Ontario, you're not supposed to say that about another province, which is in Alberta, but Banff is look it up. Look pictures, yeah, look up pictures of Banff and Lake St. Louis and stuff like that. It is the most gorgeous place on the are, planet. Are the provinces gangs? Why can't you talk about the well, others? Well, yes, because you have rivalries, right? Yeah. 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 Right. Maple, maple syrup in, fried. maple syrup out in yeah, Canada? The, what the, the fuck's happening? The provinces have some, have some well, sibling like, rivals. If yeah. Alberta gets the food, then then British Columbia doesn't get the food after um, the Hunger Games. That makes sense. <laughs> that makes sense. Okay. <laughs> All right, guys. And that'll do it for today's installment of the John Campy Show podcast. Thank you so much for being here and making the show part of your day. Big special thank you to all you guys who sent in those questions, whether you're YouTube channel members, thank you so much for being YouTube channel members, or sent in the Super Chats because you gave us great fun things to talk about, and also you supported our channel while you did it. For all those of you still here, at 3.30 this afternoon, I'm going to be doing an open mic, so come on back and chat a little bit more about the different things you guys want to talk about. And other than that, have a fabulous weekend, everybody. We'll, of course, be back again on Monday after of course, I do open mic later. So for everybody in the room, Ray Aura. Have a good weekend. <laughs> I think he was trying to be, at first I thought he was trying to be a horse, but I think it was a ghost. But anyway, see you guys later. Oh, that's right, because it's Halloween. Jonathan Boyko. Yeah, that's, that's, that's him. Chris Carr. <laughs> that's me. My name is John Gabby. Until next time, my friends. Bye-bye. <laughs>